Hello students, we are going to begin the Civil War. It feels like we've been building up to this ever since uh, I, I first started teaching you guys back in the fall, but we're going to start uh, with lesson uh, e-learning lesson number 10 and the first opening shots of the Civil War. Your first question today, your bell ringer scenario is this. Uh, you are a college student in Charleston, South Carolina, so think about where that's at. In the early, in early 1861, seven southern states have left the Union and formed their own government, including South Carolina. All-out war seems unavoidable now. Your friends have begun to volunteer for either the Union or the Confederate forces. You are torn between your home state and the United States. Without thinking and considering slavery, because that's not what I want you to consider here, would you join the Union and fight for your nation, or would you join the Confederacy and fight for your own state in the Confederate Army? That's your first question. Go ahead and pause it, and when you're ready, go ahead and uh, press play. Okay, uh, this unit or this uh, lesson is all about the opening shots of the Civil War, and these are the objectives for it. Number one, be able to define Anaconda plan. Number two, describe how the Civil War began. And then three, describe both the Union and the Confederate strategies for fighting this war. Okay, so this is a fo uh, photograph right here of Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. And he was inaugurated um, in March of 1861 after winning the 1860 election. He had zero time to relax, even before he became president, because truly the war had begun prior to him becoming president. Um, his goal uh, in this speech and his early days as president was to keep the Union together. By the time he became, uh, officially became president, seven states had already seceded or left the United States of America. So Abraham Lincoln was trying to hold together the rest of the Union and try and keep it with the United States to end this uh, without uh, many shots being fired, if he could, could do that at all. And so Abraham Lincoln had some decisions to make. Uh, really, it came down to one of these three options here. He could let the southern states go and form their own country. That was a possibility. There'd be no bloodshed that way. And there would be two Americas at that point, essentially. He never had that as a possibility. Okay, the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln believed in the Union and the fact that no state could leave the Union. That was one of their, one of their issues there. Uh, second option, he could give in on slavery and hope the southern states would return. He could basically guarantee that uh, slavery would be protected. And uh, some Democrats in Congress tried to pass a constitutional amendment uh, trying to protect slavery, but Abraham Lincoln forced the Republicans basically to reject that. He said, we can't protect slavery everywhere and guarantee that it's going to expand into new territories. And that left him the third option, use the United States military to end the revolt. And that's the decision Abraham Lincoln chose. But he chose a very non-aggressive strategy because he didn't want some of the other states to leave the Union. Unfortunately for Lincoln, the situation had been spiraling out of control before he was even president. When the southern states seceded, including South Carolina, they took control of all of the national level uh, property in their states. So let's just take South Carolina, for example. Um, when they seceded, they took control of the post offices. They took control of the forts and every single government building in the state. All except Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter, and we're going to see a lot of pictures of it, was a, a small fort on an island off the coast of South Carolina. That was the only fort that remained under Union control in South Carolina after they seceded. It basically guarded the harbor and the entryway into Charleston, so very important fort. It was commanded by Union Major Robert Anderson, and uh, we'll take a look here at what it looked like. Okay, and I'm sorry, this is actually what it looks like today. If you go visit it, it's a national park, uh, national battlefield park. So this is Fort Sumter. Like I said, it's on an island. Charleston is pro is down here where I'm moving my mouse, and it's even further away than that. It's just uh, that's what it looks like. But you can take a boat there and go tour it. It's not a large fort. Um, it's been rebuilt, as you're going to see. Um, it's a very small island, but it had cannon that could protect uh, the entryway into the harbor. 
Okay, so here's a little bit of a map of the situation. So Charleston, South Carolina, right here. Uh, largest city in South Carolina, one of the most important harbors in the entire Confederacy. And you have a narrow inlet here from the Atlantic Ocean. There were multiple forts guarding that entryway. Fort Sumter was right in the middle on Tiny, Tiny Island. But there were also uh, Fort Moultrie, Castle Pinckney, Fort Wagner, the Cummings Point Battery, and Fort Johnson. So all of these forts right here were in Confederate possession. So if you look at Fort Sumter, it's completely surrounded by these other forts here. And when President Buchanan was still president before Abraham Lincoln... Uh, he knew that this fort was surrounded and under siege. Uh, the Confederate forces there were aiming cannon. So if you look at these, uh, these shore batteries here, there's all sorts of cannons aimed right at Fort Sumter. And Major Anderson sent messages, hey, I'm surrounded. I'm running out of food, running out of supply. So James Buchanan sent uh, a ship there called the Star of the West to try and resupply uh, the fort, and the Confederates fired upon it. And so the Star of the West hightailed it way back to uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. after being fired upon. Buchanan is rated as one of our worst presidents because he did absolutely nothing to try and stop the Civil War. His handling of this wasn't much better. He basically just passed the buck. Abraham Lincoln's going to be able to figure it out. Um, and the situation deteriorated. By the time that Abraham Lincoln became president, Okay, within two weeks of it, Major Anderson inside the fort sent a message to Lincoln saying that his supplies were almost completely exhausted. Lincoln couldn't believe this. He was told prior to this that they had still had months of supplies left. So now the situation is really desperate for Lincoln. They're going to run out of food. They're going to run out of all sorts of stuff. They, they can't surrender the fort. Um, should Lincoln send the Navy in? Should Lincoln try to force the Navy in there, firing on the shore batteries, and resupply the fort. Well, he didn't want to provoke some of the other states to leave, so um, he kind of played it very passively. Uh, his decision was tough. Send supplies to the fort. If he does that, the Southerners might attack again. He could send troops to the fort, but then if he was going to send some troops in, he knew the Confederacy was going to attack the fort. Or he could choose to do nothing, basically what James Buchanan did. Um, which would mean he was basically giving up the fort to the Confederacy. He was going to surrender the very first battle, and uh, the Union was going to have to surrender Fort Sumter. Here's what Lincoln did. Um, Lincoln decided he was going to force the issue. He sent a supply ship, the USS Pawnee. It did have some weapons on it, but he instructed it not to fire whatsoever. He wanted to force the Southern forces in South Carolina to decide what they were going to do. If they were going to fire on that ship again, he wanted to make it look like the Confederacy had started uh, started the war. So he put the ball in the Confederate court. What are you guys going to do? If you want war, you're going to be the first ones to fire uh, on the fort and on this ship. President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy, the leader of the Confederacy, had another decision to make too. His goal was to try and take control of that fort for the Confederacy. How is he going to do that? So Davis decided to try and take the fort before that supply ship reached it. Because if that supply ship reached it, it'd be resupplied with all sorts of food and everything, and they wouldn't have to surrender. So uh, Jefferson Davis, on April 12, 1861, ordered the general there in Charleston Harbor, um, a general by the name of P.G.T. Beauregard, uh, his full name is Pierre Gustave Dutant Beauregard, to fire or to demand that the uh, fort surrender. Major Anderson didn't surrender. And so what did General Beauregard do? He ordered the shots fired on Fort Sumter. The Confederate troops fired on the fort for 34 hours with huge siege cannons right here. These are the cannons that were fired on the fort. Major Anderson fired back but ran out of ammunition um, when one of the cannonballs struck part of the fort and blew up one of his uh, powder storage uh, uh, rooms. So he's just getting pummeled here uh, inside the fort. So I have some paintings here that are going to show you, uh, they depict what the fort looks like before the attack. So this is the fort before the attack ever occurred, okay? And it's going to show a series of uh, pictures here of what it looked like under the attack, okay? So this is the beginning of the fort being battered, so you can just see the difference here. It's being battered by cannonball. This right here is uh, when one of the, uh, 
or when the uh, powder blew up, it blew off a huge chunk of the wall uh, of the fort right here. And then this is the end, and it's no longer the United States flag flying right there. It's uh, going to be replaced by a Confederate flag. All right, so the fort is just basically demolished. Here's pictures of uh, the wall. You can see where these cannonballs were impacting and exploding. This is the interior of the fort. You can see it's basically been wrecked. Um, the amazing thing on this is not a single Union soldier uh, died. Not a single Union soldier died on this assault. Uh, when you look at the pictures of the fort, it's almost amazing that that happened. But the fort was pretty severely damaged. And in the end, Major Anderson had to surrender the fort to the Confederacy. And that leads us to our first question, or our, our second question, actually. What was the opening battle of the Civil War? Was it A, Battle of New Orleans, B, Shiloh, C, Gettysburg, or D, Fort Sumter? After the battle of Fort Sumter, um, the additional states of Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina joined the original seven states of the Confederacy. Now there's 11 states in the Confederacy. At this point, Abraham Lincoln calls uh, for the states to raise an army of 75,000 volunteers to put down this rebellion. 75, that's a big number right there. But Lincoln's going to realize very early on, as we're going to see, that that's a tiny number and it's not even close to what's going to be uh, required. This is a picture right here of... Uh, an advertisement in Virginia immediately after Abraham Lincoln makes that call for volunteers, Virginia begins advertising, hey, we need, we need to raise our own army because the Union's going to invade into Virginia to try and take over the Confederacy. So Lincoln makes his call for volunteers. The Confederacy immediately responds by calling up for volunteers to join the Confederate Army as well. And that goes back to what your bell ringer question is. Are you going to fight for the Union, the United States, or are you going to fight for your state? So here's uh, what it looks like. Okay, the green states are the states that are in the Confederacy. The uh, purple states are the states that are in the Union. The yellow, or I'm sorry, the orange states, these are slave states that end up joining the Union. Uh, when I say Kentucky joined the Union and Missouri joined the Union, yes, technically they joined the Union, but about half of both those states uh, supported slavery and supported uh, the Confederacy. The, Battles inside those states are pretty brutal. A lot of neighbors fighting neighbors. Officially, those states belong to the Union, though. And I have West Virginia here striped. West Virginia, what the western half of Virginia didn't have a whole lot of slave owners, and it broke away uh, from the state of Virginia, and two years later, in 1863, created the state of West Virginia, which was part of the Union. Okay, so let's get to other strategies. What are the strategies these sides are going to use to fight the war? The original northern strategy, I say original because the Union strategy is going to change several times, uh, was to try and squeeze the South. The nickname for this plan becomes the Anaconda Plan. That's not what the guy that developed it called it. Uh, General Winfield Scott, uh, old general. I mean, we remember him from the Mexican-American War. He was also uh, in the War of 1812. Uh, he developed the plan. Uh, he did not call it Anaconda. That's the name that was given to it by newspapers that were trying to make fun of it. The whole plan was trying to was to try and squeeze and put pressure on the Confederacy, blockade all the southern ports because the the Union has the much larger navy. Um, try and isolate the Confederacy, just slowly press in, squeeze control, but take control of the Mississippi River and hope that by putting that pressure on the Confederacy, eventually cooler heads will prevail in this war and there'll be enough economic pressure put on the Confederacy that they'll come back into the Union. Okay, This is uh, the cartoon in a newspaper making fun of this plan, uh, which gave it the name the Anaconda Plan, uh, General Winfield Scott's Great Snake. So even though this is making fun of it a little bit, it pretty accurately describes what the opening strategy was. Wrap around like an anaconda and the head of that snake Try and take control of the Mississippi River. Separate the Confederacy into two sides. Okay, question number three. What was the name given to the original Union strategy to win the war? Was it A, Operation Mongoose, B, Anaconda Plan, C, Plan Orange, or D, Nightcrawler Plan? Okay, what about the Southern strategy? The Confederacy chose 
to try and fight a defensive war of attrition, meaning we're going to play defense, try and kill as many Union soldiers as possible. Our strategy is to try and win this war without losing it. Don't expose your forces too much. Uh, and over time, it's going to be long and drawn out. You're going to wear out the enemy. The Union's going to grow tired of, of death. They're going to grow tired of the casualties. Really, this is the same strategy George Washington applied when fighting the British in uh, the Revolutionary War. Eventually, they hoped that because Europeans needed cotton so much in their textile mills that they would get European support, specifically Great Britain. Again, kind of uh, the reverse strategy of George Washington getting the support of the French. So fight a defensive war. Uh, don't expose your own army too much. Try to kill as many Union soldiers as you can without your own soldiers being killed because the Confederacy has much, much less men than the Union has. And eventually get the... Uh, European nations to support the Confederacy. So that's the Southern strategy. Okay, so uh, number four, which of the following was not part of the original Confederate strategy to win the war? Which was not part of the original strategy? A, fight on the defensive. B, slowly wear out the Union. C, get support from Europe. Or D, burn Washington, D.C. to the ground. And that brings us to our last question of uh, e-learning lesson number 10. Which side do you think had the best plan to win the, the Civil War and why? All right, guys, have a great rest of your day.